Well, my dad used to have a saying that there were three types of people that you really wanted to know in your life. One was a good mechanic, somebody that you could trust to take care of your cars. One was a pastor who could marry, bury, visit you when you're sick, care for your soul. And as we got a little older into our technolo technology era, he added that you really needed somebody who was good at fixing computers. Because no matter what, your computer is always going to have problems eventually, and we are so dependent upon them that eventually you need to have somebody fix it. Well, as I've gotten a little older, and that, now granted, I'm, I'm not that old, contrary to what my wife might tell you, but I realized that there's a fourth person that you need in your life. You need a physical therapist. Somebody that can help you when your body begins to fail. And it just so happens that coming to North Hills, we have found our physical therapist. Now, so that you guys don't th go at him, but I remember when I got back from the Philippines a few months ago, my wife was really having a lot of hip pain. She was having hip pain, and she was stretching, she was icing, all this, and, and she went to this person, and he, and he said, yeah, you, ha you have hip pain. It's your back. She's like, no, it's my hip. No, it, it's your back. But my back doesn't hurt. Sure enough, the next day, she was out working in the garden. She leaned over, and her back went out. She went back to him, and he said, yep, it was your back. You see, sometimes pain kind of shows up in a place that it's not originating from. Sometimes that pain kind of shows up, and we try to address that pain at that source, when the reality is that the source of that pain is somewhere else entirely. And when we spend so much time focused on where we feel the pain and not where the pain is coming from, we miss the opportunity to address the real problem. In the book of Nehemiah that we've been going through for the past couple of weeks, there was a very real observance of pain in the fact that the city walls were burned, the gates were burned, the walls were in ruins. And Nehemiah saw that, and he came, and he wanted to address the problem of the walls. But as we go further into this book, we start realizing that the walls aren't the problem. The walls are merely a symptom of a greater problem. And that greater problem begins to emerge in chapter 5. The greater problem begins to emerge, and we begin to see in a very real way, as we've said from the very first chapter, the book of Nehemiah was never about rebuilding a wall, but it was about restoring a people for God's own pleasure. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 5. Now, this will be up on the screen and, and I know that sometimes we, we, we want to rely on the screen to be able to see it, but I would really love if you would either turn in your Bibles, physical, or scroll up in your Bible on your phone, whatever it is you're most comfortable with, because we really want to see that it, what's up here is actually here. We don't want to, to kind of confuse that. I'm not trying to get over on anybody. This is the Word of God as it has been revealed to us. Nehemiah chapter 5. Now, for the first couple of chapters of Nehemiah, everything was going great. Everything Nehemiah said his heart and mind to do came seemingly easy. And many of us can look at that like, man, that's like Hollywood. That just doesn't happen. Everything he puts his mind to do is good. Some of us know this person. Whatever they touch turns to gold, while the rest of us just kind of look around. It seems like everything we touch starts to crumble. Nehemiah, just everything was going great. Well, last week we were in chapter 4, and we began to see the start of Nehemiah's first taste of opposition. Opposition from Sambalit and Tobiah, and they were just coming strong against it, but we saw that those were really empty threats. They threatened violence, they threatened intimidation, but nothing came of it at all. Now in chapter 5, something potentially more dangerous comes up, and Nehemiah is about to have his greatest challenge yet. It seems that there are those in Jerusalem who are taking advantage 
of their brothers and sisters. They're taking advantage of other Jewish people to get rich themselves. Now, why is this so important to address? Because one of the greatest reasons why these people find their their city in ruins, why they find themselves spread out all over the known world in exile, was because they didn't obey God's law. God gave them the law through Moses that they were to obey, and if they obeyed it, that this would lead to prosperity of their nation. And they not only didn't follow the law, but they became somewhat indifferent to it. They just didn't seem to really think it was all that important, looking for loopholes. And this led to God's judgment on the nation of Israel. And one of the major reasons why the law was broken was with regard to the poor and those who were impoverished. In fact, within the law of Moses, there were safeguards to prevent people from remaining in poverty. And there were, there were safeguards to prevent families from being stuck in generational poverty. There was a couple different things in the law that you could not do with regard to your own people. Now, we got to remember, this is talking about the, the nation of Israel, Jewish people, brothers and sisters, united by blood. This was one people. You couldn't charge them interest if you lent them money. You could not charge your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, your distant relative, so long as they were within the kingdom of Israel, you couldn't charge them interest. Second thing was, well, every seven years, all debts were canceled. So every seven years, and that didn't matter, so every seven years, a fixed date, debt was canceled. Even if you lent somebody money in the, sixth, the second half of the sixth year, on that seventh year, it was wiped out. And in fact, God even said in that that if you harden your heart against your brother who is in need in the sixth year, that he would bring judgment on you. You were to give and to lend no matter what year it was. And the other thing was, every 50 years, all people were allowed to return to their ancestral land. You see, when, when Moses led the people out of Egypt and then Joshua led them into the promised land, they divided up the land into basically family estates. And you could not sell your family estate in perpetuity forever. Every 50 years, the land got redistributed to the family that it was originally given to under Joshua. So every 50 years, you had a clean slate. This was, in a sense, to prevent generational poverty. Now, we know that this these laws were one of the ones that the Jewish, the Jewish people pretty much disregarded. And Deuteronomy 15.4 tells us that if the people of Israel would have followed the law, there would be no poor people in the land of Israel. There would be enough prosperity for everybody to have enough. So when Nehemiah finds out that there is blatant disregard for God's law, he is rightfully concerned. You see, he's rightfully concerned because he's building a wall and all of the work that he has done in God's name could come crashing down if the people return to their wicked ways that sent them into exile in the first place. He's not about to have the work that he has put in come crashing down because of a few greedy people. Remember, this isn't about rebuilding a city or even a nation, but it's about restoring a people. And those three words that we have been talking about, remember, restore, and remain, in chapter 5, we've kind of moved beyond the remembering, and now we're into the restoration, the restoring. And what we learn today in our big idea is that restoring God's people requires that even the poor are restored. You can't restore a nation unless all of the nation of that people are restored. 
This is important when we see what Nehemiah was doing. The people of Israel were a people that through their words and actions, how they treated one another, how they treated even the least in their nation, would be a shining light of God's glory to the nations. They were supposed to be different. They were supposed to be unique. In a sense, they were supposed to be a little weird. So that when people saw them, they would give glory to God in heaven. How would Nehemiah respond to this growing crisis? How would you respond? Let's read. So what we're going to do is we're going to read a couple chunks at a time, and through this we will read the entire chapter. The first chunk we're going to read is 1 through 5. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children are as their children, yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it is not in our power to help it, for other men own our fields and our vineyards. Now, the first thing that we have to understand is that Nehemiah gives us kind of, he gives us his model for how he's going to deal with this. And we can follow it pretty closely, even in some of the situations in our own lives. The people that we come across who are in poverty, the people that we come across that are struggling. This is a pretty good model for us to follow. And the first thing that Nehemiah teaches us is that you listen to the plight of the poor. Now, when people bring a complaint, many of us, when people bring us a complaint, it's so quick to just tune it out. We can just immediately say, oh, that's not my problem, or I'm not going to deal with that, or I don't have time to deal with that right now. It's easy to just dismiss somebody's problem, particularly in a situation like this, where it would be very easy for Nehemiah to say, well, you got yourself into this situation, you get yourself out. But that's not what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah set everything else aside. He set the building of the wall aside. He set the administration aside. He stops and he listens. He could have passed, but he stops and he listens. Nehemiah, knowing the scriptures and knowing what the consequences of such blatant disregard for God's law, he had to deal with it. Nothing is more important than people. There's no organization that's more important than the people that are a part of it. Because that, whether or not it's a nation such as Israel, whether or not it's a company you work for or a school, it is the people that make that organization. And if you don't care for the people, then you've ceased, particularly in this case, to be who you are called to be, to be the nation of Israel. The wall could wait for Nehemiah because the people took priority. So what does Nehemiah do? The first thing he does is he just listens. You'll see the first chapter, or the first five verses of this chapter, the only thing Nehemiah says is what they say. He doesn't respond. He just listens. And he tells us what they say. And my guess is that if you've ever heard somebody complain who is in deep distress, that this is probably a summary. There were probably went on for hours. It probably went on for maybe days as people came and said what was going on. But Nehemiah listened. Listening is hard sometimes. Because we have to put aside our agenda. We have to put aside our preconceived notions and prejudices. And we just need to be on their time. And we need to listen and we need to give people enough time to tell exactly what it is that they're going through. Many of us understand this in marriage. We need to listen. And some of us know that certain husband who when he admits that his wife says he has two faults. One is that he doesn't listen and he can't remember the second one. 
Sometimes the very best thing that you can do is to just stop and listen to somebody. Sometimes in listening, the person gets to speak and realizes that maybe their problem wasn't all that much of a problem in the first place. Just by having a listening ear and not trying to fix it, but just listening, you can allow them to just have the therapy that they need to pour out their hearts to you. Some of us, we can listen for a minute and then we just get fed up and we're like, no, I, this is what you need to do to solve that problem. No, we need to just listen. Just listen. And when we listen, we restore somebody's sense of dignity. We restore, in a sense, their humanity and we give them permission to feel what's going on in their lives. We don't dismiss them, but we, in a sense, empower them. We give them a sense of restore their sense of belonging. My guess is that the people who were struggling had a real sense that maybe they weren't part of the nation of Israel anymore, that they were dismissed, disregarded, disrespected, and they just felt like outsiders. But by Nehemiah listening, he restored their sense of belonging and their sense of purpose. So Nehemiah learned. Just by listening, he learned what was going on. These people didn't have enough food to feed their families. They were struggling just to feed their families, so what they were doing was they were selling or mortgaging their ancestral homes just to be able to buy enough food to feed their growing families, just to be able to pay the king's taxes. They were borrowing money, and we'll learn in verse 6 that they were at, well, a little bit further, I think it's verse 6, but they'll learn that the people that they were borrowing from were their own brothers and sisters in the nation of Israel, and contrary to God's law, they were charging them interest. They're borrowing money to pay for the taxes on their field. And when that runs out to the horror of Nehemiah, they're being forced to sell their children into slavery. This is not a good situation. And this is something that could easily bring the wrath of God. So Nehemiah diagnoses that there are two problems here. The wealthy Jewish people are making money off of their brothers and sisters, sending them further and further into poverty, and that they are not seeing themselves as united as one nation, but seeing a division between the rich and the poor. And the rich have no regard for the poor, particularly the poor's children. Because how could you allow your own family to be sold into slavery? And that's the problem. The problem is one of identity. They don't see themselves as one. They don't see themselves as a unified nation, but they see themselves as individuals in that, and that has to stop. So Nehemiah diagnoses it, and he shows that, that this is an issue of the unity of the nation. When one person is poor, it affects everyone. When one person suffers, the whole nation suffers. Just because you're rich and somebody's poor, when that poor person's son or daughter is sold into slavery, that's your son and daughter that's sold into slavery. He makes it very clear. You cannot allow this to continue. If this people, for God's own pleasure, is to be restored to the glory of God, it must include everyone. Now, it's easy for us to get bogged down in, in this idea of, of poverty, we look around the world at us today, and it is just overwhelming. The poverty in the world, not just in our country, because if we're in, in our country, there's poverty, but there's also poverty in places like South America or Africa. There's poverty all over the world that we can't even fathom what's going on. And it's easy for us to think we just can't do anything. How can we possibly take care of all of this? It is just too much to bear. And to be honest, this verse doesn't even speak to ending poverty around the world. What this verse does do is speak to how you treat those who are in the kingdom of God. And maybe we're not the nation of Israel now. But my guess is that as you're listening, you can probably see how this might apply to the church. You can see how this might apply to the plight of other Christians. Those Christ followers and making sure we're doing our part to treat impoverished Christians here and around the world with dignity and maybe sometimes just listening. Who do you need to listen to? Who can you give your time to where you just listen without judgment or offering easy fixes? Because we know that it's not an easy fix. Even Nehemiah understood it wasn't an easy fix and it was going to take time. But can we just listen? 
Nehemiah first listened. But he didn't stop there and say, well, I'll pray for you. He got to work. So let's continue reading. Verse 6 through 13. I was very angry when I heard their outcry and their words. I took counsel with myself and brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you are exacting interest each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against him and said to them, we, as far as we are able, have brought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations, but you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent, could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunt of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day the percentage of the money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praise the Lord. And the people did as they promised. The second thing Nehemiah teaches us is that we need to address the problems. And problems is plural because there are multiple problems here to deal with. Now, some of you may be kind of taken aback by, by verse 6 with a, with a word. Nehemiah got angry. Now, we've been taught for much, if you've grown up in church any length of time, you've been taught that being angry is always a sin. That, it's, that, that to get angry is to lose control and it's a sin. But that's not actually what the Bible teaches us. In fact, sometimes to be angry is the logical and appropriate response to the situation that you're witnessing. Nehemiah got angry. There are times when this is appropriate. But let's be careful lest we become consumed by our anger, lest it lead to sin. As the Bible says, be angry, yet do not sin. Then we get to verse 7, and I think we kind of go through this pretty quickly, but verse 7 is kind of an interesting verse in that there's a pause there. I took counsel with myself. Pause. We don't know how long this pause took place. But we know that this is probably a good idea that you don't go into a situation angry. Nehemiah was angry, but probably not going to be the driving force behind going in this situation. He needs to first take counsel with himself, cool off a little. It doesn't mention that he prays in this situation, but our first four chapters, his prayer life probably implies that there was quite a bit of prayer going on here. I'm going to read that into the text. I hope he prayed because that's the first thing you should do. But he took counsel with himself. And after he takes counsel with himself, he brings charges against the nobles. He went directly to the offenders. See, this is something we don't often do. Sometimes we hear about something, we go to somebody else and say, did you hear about that? Are, are you okay with that? We'll go to a leader and say, did I, I heard a rumor about that. I think we should address it. No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't gather support for his cause. He goes directly to the person. And this is very biblical. If you have a problem with somebody, you go to that person. You don't go to anybody else. And that's exactly what Nehemiah does. He goes directly to the people and brings charges against them. And he brings the charge is that, one, they are exacting interest on loans that they're making to their brothers in violation of God's law. And they are selling their brethren or allowing them to be sold as slaves. Now, we can't miss verse 9 because I think it's pretty important because verse 6, he's very angry. But you notice in verse 9, when he gets to the confrontation, The thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations of our enemies? Now, as I was reading that and meditating over it, I I realized that there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of anger in 
Nehemiah's discourse with these people as he's bringing these, these charges against them. You see, what's happening here is that Nehemiah doesn't just want to restore the poor, but he doesn't want to destroy the rich either. He loves these people as children of God just as much as he does everybody else. He's not just about restoring the poor, but restoring the nation. So verse 9, he tells them, this isn't good. And tells them what they should be doing. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God? Aren't you not to obey the law? He didn't destroy one part of the nation to save another. Sometimes, particularly if we go in angry, we immediately go in with a sense of, I am going to crush these people for what they've done, and they are going to get the vengeance of God, but that is not what we should do. We lovingly rebuke people and seek to restore them as well. So what was Nehemiah's plan? Well, Nehemiah was personally going to lend them money and grain. And then he said, we are going to stop charging interest to our brothers. Their ancestral homes would be returned to them. They will also restore to them the interest that was taken, whether that was in money, whether or not that was in grain or wine, restore it to them. And then we read that nothing more will be required of them. Verse 12, we will restore these and require nothing from them. This is a beautiful picture of repentance. This is what repentance is. Repentance isn't saying, I'm sorry. But repentance is making right the wrong that you have done. Not for the sake of, of, of earning back that repentance from God. Let's be honest and let's be truthful. The repentance we have when we, when we repent and confess our sins to God, he promises to separate them as far as the east from, is from the west. But that doesn't mean that the consequences of our actions can just go unchecked. There is a part of repentance that requires you to fix what you have done wrong. You fix what was broken. And that's exactly what they did. Notice that not one person stood up and said, um, I think you're being a little harsh with us. Or are you sure that, uh, that they didn't just get into this situation on their own? No. They said, we will do everything that you have said. In the sense, we repent of what we do. They, in a sense were willing to dive in and deal with the mess. I remember one day that I went to the refrigerator to get some milk for my cereal. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this when the milk is just kind of out, like leaning on the door, and as soon as you open it, it hits the floor and goes everywhere. Anyone ever have this experience? So here I am, I'm standing there, the milk is everywhere, it's all over me, it's all over the floor, it's all over the counter, and somehow it made its way up to the, the upstairs closet. <laughs> it's everywhere. So immediately I pick up my phone and call Amanda and I said, we're selling the house and moving. Because I don't want to deal with this mess. But here's what, in a sense, happens when we fail to deal with a mess like that. We know that if milk is left out, it begins to stink. And you come in, and you're just like, man, what is that smell? Oh, yeah, I spilled milk everywhere a week ago, but I didn't clean it up. The same thing is true with sin. Same thing is true with when we fail to follow what God has told us to do. When we fail to address the mess around us, it begins to stink. And this is exactly what happened with the people of Nehemiah. It began to stink. And now you have an even bigger mess to clean up. Because it's really hard to get that smell out. For many of us, the idea of confronting anyone with their sin is terrifying. We would just assume, just deal with ourselves and, and listen to those people who take passages out of context like, don't judge others. And that's not what it says. We are within the people of God to hold each other accountable to what God has called us to do. And that is exactly what we're called to do. Not all of us have letters from the king that basically asserts our authority over the nation. But we're all called to confront people with their sin. 
And that's what the gospel of Jesus actually calls us to do, this side of the cross. In order for people to come to Jesus, they must first be confronted with the sin that separates them from God so that they will know what it is that they need saving from. Nehemiah's role in this was not to, in a sense, fix the problem, but to confront people with their sin. And then when he confronts them with their sin, he provides a way of getting out of that. Our role is really to do the same. You can't fix everyone. You can't fix their problems. You can't repent of their sin for them. You can only point them to the great healer. You can only point them to Jesus, the only one that can restore them. But it's not enough to call people to a lifestyle. Those who have attained it, who have followed Jesus or followed God any length of time, must model it for others. Let's finish this chapter, verse 14 to 19. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them for their daily ration 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also persevered in the work on this wall, and we acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox and six choice sheep and birds, and every 10 days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this, I did not demand the food allowance of the governor, because the service was too heavy on this people." Remember, my, remember for my good, O oh my God, all that I have done for this people. Third and final thing that Nehemiah shows us is that you are to lead by example. Now, we learn here that Nehemiah didn't make a change at this point. You might think, well, Nehemiah sees that the, the plight of the people, he's going to make a change, and he is going to now stop exacting the, the, the daily rations of the governor's allowance from the people. No, we learn that he never did. From the very beginning of the time that he got in there, 12 years, he put aside his rights, his entitlements, for the good of the people, and he tells us why he did that. For the fear of the Lord, for the fear of God. He was always leading by example. You see, Nehemiah cared for the people of Israel. He cared about the individual plight of the poor. He cared even about the rich people that were sinning, and he calls them to repentance. He always saw their burdens, and he resolved not to add to them. He was not going to be the person that added. So, he paid for everything out of his own pocket. Nehemiah led by example in one, in work. Nehemiah, being the governor, did not have to do any work. He could just dictate to people what to do, but he actually, we're told, is working on the wall. He acquired no land from anyone, even though as the governor he would have been very, very within his rights to go take the best land and say, all right, you get off this is mine now. But he never did that. In fact, he worked closely to the law, wall, he lived closely to the wall, and he led by example. He led in generosity. There were 150 people that ate at his table. 150 people. How many of you have ever had a family reunion once a year that had 150 people? I don't think I've ever been to a family reunion that's been more than 50, and I know how crazy it is to feed that many people. All the different opinions. I like mashed potatoes. I like french fries. I like, you know, scallop potatoes. I mean, just potatoes, you have like 50 different preferences. And you have Nehemiah here with 150 people every single day eating at his table. What does it tell us? He paid for it himself. How amazing is that? He led in generosity. Notice that Nehemiah definitely puts the burden of the poor on the rich. 
Just think about that for a minute. Not once are the poor criticized in this, ver- in this chapter. Not once are they criticized for making poor choices that led them to be poor. That's something that's definitely something we should take to heart. So far in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah, and we should believe it will continue, he has exercised an incredible amount of humility. An incredible amount of humility in not lording his position over people. When many in his position would have been demanding their rights, demanding their tribute that was brought to them, demanding everything that was due their position, he seems to flippantly set it aside for the greater good. He's not ashamed to work. He's not ashamed to be generous and doesn't seem to hold his generosity even as a virtue that says, look at me, how generous I am. And I'll tell you why I think that's the case, because it is only in chapter 5 that we are really seeing the generosity that he has exhibited. This should remind us of Jesus. It should remind us of Jesus as he washed his disciples' feet, putting aside their, his position as the second person of the Trinity and being that of a servant, we see that in his serving, he does not become less than who he is. Some of us think by serving, we will become less than the people we serve. But if Jesus is an example, you can't become less than Jesus. Yet, he humbly serves. But even beyond that, I I think this story reminds me of the Apostle Paul even more. And particularly in Acts chapter 20, verses 33 to 35, and in writing to the Corinthian church, he tells them, I coveted no one's silver or gold apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. I wonder if Paul were reading Nehemiah 5 as his example in dealing with the Corinthian church. As I, we kind of close out this message and lead into the Lord's Supper, I'm always reminded of just great examples of generosity people that are willing to give up everything to follow Jesus. I think of missionaries that live great lives, have great jobs, and then feel that call to the mission field, and they sell everything. They uproot their families to go to a place so that people can hear the gospel. They use their gifts and their abilities. But I think sometimes we think that that the life of sacrifice and the leading by example is reserved for what we call the professionals, the pastors, the missionaries, those who we see think should have a life of sacrifice. But is it possible that God doesn't call just pastors and missionaries or church workers or those who work in nonprofit Christian work to be a life of sacrifice, but he calls all of us to lead by example in terms of generosity, leadership, and humility. God calls all of us to care for everyone in his church. To best of our ability to resolve ourselves not to add to the burdens of those who are poor, but alleviate some of that poverty doesn't necessarily mean we're always giving away money, but it does mean that we perhaps are teaching people how to better manage their finances, how to set goals. As we think about this, is there someone that you could invite into your life that you could help disciple, listen to their story, how they got to where they're at, help address some of the problems? Maybe it is external where there are people that are abusing them and help them to sever ties with them. Maybe it's helping them to overcome some of their own lack of education and challenges. Help them setting goals. Is there somebody that you could do that with with the goal of helping them get out of the situation that they're in? And I think the, the most applicable way that we can do this is to focus on Christians first. And I know there's poverty everywhere and we can't alleviate all of it, but is it possible that 
maybe we might end poverty in Christianity, in our own church first, in our own community of Christians first, and then even thinking around the world, thinking about Christians first. Because in the book of Nehemiah, it was Jewish people first. It's very sad when we find Christians that are struggling when we have so much. Will we step out and help them? And I believe that North Hills has done a great job of really seeking to alleviate some of the poverty in our church through benevolence funds and year-end giving to Christian ministries in the community. We want to do our part to help alleviate poverty. But let's make it personal. This is our reflection. What are you doing to restore the poor in the kingdom of God? What's your personal role? It's that person that you can invite into your, your story and help. The person you can pray, the person you can reach out and help them. Because it is not just one person or one church's responsibility, it is all of our responsibility to restore the dignity of the poor. Thank you for watching. We hope this message has encouraged you as you seek to love God, serve others, and change the world. Check us out on our website, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel in order to receive more updates and resources from North Hills. God bless.